in. Hi everyone and welcome to Raincoast's very first live and interactive online learning program. My name is Maureen and I am one of the educators here at the Raincoast Conservation Foundation and I'm also going to be your host for today's episode. And I'm joining you of the Kowakiwak First Nations here in the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. So our lives are drastically different from the one we used to know right now due to the global pandemic. So in an effort to help support teachers and students and families at home and those who just want to continue learning, Raincoast is launching our Coastal Insights online learning program. So each week we're going to be delivering a fun and interactive live program to help people improve their understanding of coastal British Columbia and also help people gain new perspective on where we live. So the goal of these programs is to help connect people to place and hopefully inspire more people to become stewards of the lands, waters, and wildlife of coastal British Columbia. So we're excited to welcome you to our very first episode. And in today's episode, you're gonna be learning a little bit more about Raincoast Conservation Foundation. So who we are, what we do, and some of the conservation efforts that we're, we're partaking in, in the coast. So we're also gonna be taking you on a journey to discover the coastline of BC to understand how special and important it is, but also some of the conservation issues that's facing today. So here to join us for our very first episode is our feature presenter. And he is one of our compassionate and dedicated educators for the Salish Sea Program. He's also our Marine Operations Coordinator and a co-creator of this series. So I introduce to you Nathaniel Flickman. Hello, Mo. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here broadcasting to you guys from, uh, from my backyard. So, so as Maureen said, uh, uh, I'm going to be presenting episode number one, which is a journey to the, to the BC coast. So I am, uh, I'm broadcasting to you today from, from my home in the, uh, the seaside hamlet of Shirley, British Columbia. So I'm uh, on the edge of the Pachidat and Souk First Nations traditional territories. And I just want to acknowledge that this broadcast as well as all the other broadcasts to follow are all taking place on unceded traditional territories. And I just think it's really important that we acknowledge that right from the get go here. So who am I? So my name is Nathaniel Glickman. And as uh, Maureen said, I I'm an educator with the Raincoast Conservation Foundation. Uh, so, so I am a teacher, but I, I'm not your normal teacher. I don't work in a classroom. Uh, I don't prepare extensive lesson plans. I essentially allow nature to do the teaching. So I work with students, I work with adults in the environment, really teaching them about the ecology and, and connectedness of these incredible places that we live. And so this photo here, this is me uh, giving a little rundown to some students that we hosted aboard our, our sailing vessel, Achiever, and uh, sort of really introducing them to the, to the geography and helping to foster a, a bit of a sense of place. So this is my normal classroom. I'm normally working outside. Uh, I'm normally teaching about, about birds, about marine invertebrates, about plants. And I by no means am an expert on any of those fields but I've got this broad knowledge set that I get to share with students and I really get to see them become experts. But for me, you know, my, my passion for this coast didn't really come from a, a scientific lens. It came from going out and enjoying it. So this, this photo here, you know, this is how I spend my time. I, I chase powder. I make sure that I'm, I'm on every weather system that comes. We chase swells, we make sure that we're exploring all the beaches on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And, and it's through this experience that I've developed a really strong connection and love for where I live. And I think that is the foundation of, of everything that we're doing here with this program is really fostering this, this love for place and this connection. And if you don't love where you're from, you are not going to uh, protect it. So who is Raincoast Conservation Foundation? Some of you may have heard of us, some of you maybe not. Um, so we, we are 
physics and science empowered by, empowered by our research to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of coastal British Columbia. And so this is us. We're, we're a diverse team. And, and so yes, we are scientists and yes, we are conservationists, but that word conservationist includes so many different kinds of people. It might be like myself or Mo, where we spend our time as educators. It might be like our, our captains that, that run our, our research vessel. And it might be people who really focus on, on photography and videography. And there's so many different ways to engage within the, uh, the world of, of conservation. So a big part of what we do here at Rain Coast is we investigate. We are a science-based organization, and this is what sets us apart from many other different environmental organizations here on the coast. Everything we do is set in a foundation of credible and rigorous peer-reviewed science. So everything that we work with, we make sure is as credible as possible. And so this uh, part of that investigate is this boat here. And so we use, this vessel is called Achiever, and we use Achiever to investigate this shoreline. We've done research on marine mammals, on, on seabirds, on, on all kinds of different creatures. And it's, this ship has really allowed us to access these places, but also be able to use it as a teaching platform. So we, we have a lab at the University of Victoria, and this lab is called the Applied Conservation Science Lab. And so we, we approach questions that really allow, allow you to use the principles of science and ecology to address different conservation issues that we're facing here on the coast of British Columbia. So it's, it's a really neat meshing of, of science as well as social science and politics. Um, and everywhere we work on this coast, we partner with the local Indigenous people who live there. We provide we provide them with income and they provide us with this unbelievable set of knowledge that we as scientists and outsiders will never be able to achieve without, without living there and putting in that intergenerational knowledge that comes with engaging like that. And so then this here is one of the foundations of, of how Rain Coast investigates is we try and do so without having any negative impacts on the organisms that we work with. So this here is a, a barbed wire fence here. It's a, it, it's, we'll learn a lot more about it in the future, but it, it's a means to, to get all kinds of different information out of bears without having to tranquilize them, without having to put radio collars. And we, we basically just collect their hair, and from that hair we can answer all kinds of different questions about what are they eating? What are their stress levels like? How far are they traveling? There's many different things, and by doing so, it actually leads to better science because we're not we're not poking and prodding at the bears, we're allowing them to act naturally. And this is a, a real foundation in the ethics that goes into to everything that we do here at, uh, at Rain Coast. And so I've mentioned bears a few times and, and this really is one of those uh, really iconic species that Rain Coast does work, work with. And, and a big part of that is that a lot of our work is in the Great Bear Rainforest, the, the area from the top of Vancouver Island up to the Alaska border. This is the last big wild rainforest in, in the temperate world and these bears are what make it super unique. So we work with beautiful little black bears like this and we work on, on coastal wolves. Before Rainco started its coastal wolf project, there was absolutely, there was very little that was actually known, especially in the scientific literature, about how wolves on the coast of BC, how they make a living. And then we work on this guy here. So, so picture here is a southern resident killer whale. Um, a, an endangered species and, and a species that is all over the news these days because we, we know that there is some serious threats to their survival. Um, and now you'll notice there's a few things that each of these three species have in common and, and one is that they are apex predators. And so they are at the top of the food chain. And so they're, they're what we call umbrella species. So an umbrella species is essentially a species that exists at the very top of the food web. And by protecting them, we allow all the things that depend, that they depend on in terms of uh, survival. So if a grizzly bear needs, it needs healthy phytoplankton, it needs, um, you know, salmon, it needs all the, it basically needs all these different pieces in order to, to sustain itself. So if we can protect those top predators, then we've, we've protected uh, everything else below them. And now the second thing that all these species have in common is this guy right here, the Pacific salmon. And so those guys are umbrella species where these guys are the foundation species. So this is the base of energy in this, in this system. This is really what, uh, 
what what allows this this coastline to really thrive for so many large organisms to live in in uh, close quarters with each other alongside human beings and and uh, yeah salmon really is the foundation and and can't be overstated how important it is on the coast so we investigate and that's the first part of what we do but another another pillar of of uh, what we do is we inform so who cares if you go out and and do really great science if you're not putting that science to work so informing is how it's us taking that knowledge that we've gained from doing this research and telling the people who make the decisions so providing that information to the government so when they go to make a big decision they they have all the information that uh, that exists and they have to listen to what uh, to what you provide another piece of what we do here is uh we've become a little bit infamous for taking the federal government to court so here we're partnered with a bunch of different environmental nonprofits, where we're essentially trying to hold the government accountable because they they have their own laws state that they have to protect endangered species such as the southern residents and so we're there to make sure that they live up to their own rules and the third part of what we do we investigate we inform and we inspire and in inspiration can come in many forms and this photo here may seem unrelated but this is actually how i became involved with rain coast and really how i became with involved in conservation here on the coast is uh, we did a program many years ago where we, we created this incredible surfing film that was seen by people around the world that really showed the importance and the beauty of, of this natural coastline we have here. These days though, inspiration looks a lot more like this. We've, we've really been ramping up our youth programs that we've been doing in the last couple of years and, and we've started a program called the Sailor Sea Emerging Stewards Program. So by extension, all of you guys who are here watching are you guys are actually kind of a part of this program. Um, the Sailor Sea Emerging Stewards Program is focused really in the, the Sailor Sea Basin, which is, you know, in and around Victoria, Vancouver, Seattle. But really this program we're opening up to everyone else around the coast because unfortunately, we, uh, we can't engage in the same way we normally do. So with this program, it involves taking students out on our research vessel, teaching them all about the organisms that live on this coast, and really trying to foster this love and, and care for these, uh, these special places. But uh, as this program developed, we, we started realizing that we were building these incredible relationships with these really inspiring youth, but we had to say goodbye. So we, we, we created a, a sort of next level on that program. And this is what we're calling the Junior Leaders Program. So these three students you see pictured here, um, they're all grade 12 students from the Cowichan School District. And they've been with us for the last year, training on all kinds of different aspects of ecology and, and conservation, um, field techniques and education, and really learning how to essentially do my job so so these guys were really uh we're helping to mentor them and, and these are faces that you guys are going to uh, become familiar with because each of them is going to be teaching one of these lessons about different aspects of the british columbia coast so now we know about rain coast let's dive a little bit deeper into to bc and and what makes bc special and and why we all love living here and i don't often find someone say that they do not love living in beautiful British Columbia. It's, it's a breathtaking place. And, and there's, for me, one of the main reasons for that is, is that we really, we have this unique place where we have such incredible high alpine terrain wedged right up against the ocean. And, and the two interact, the ocean and the mountains and the lands really interact here in a way that is really uncommon in, in a lot of coastlines around the planet. So we have, we have beautiful places like this, the, the gorgeous Kitlope Valley here, where we have these complex systems of, of river valleys and, and fjords, all shaped by, by these, by, by glaciers, by glacial processes. As, as ice ages happen over time in British Columbia and these huge ice fields build up and then melt and build up and then melt, they've shaped this, this coastline into this incredible series of, of valleys and fjords and it, it also left this, this sort of fractured and complex coastline where, where we see 40,000 islands. So 40,000 islands along the coast of BC. And that equivalents to 25, 
thousand kilometers of shoreline. So that is almost the circum circumference of the globe at the equator. So really this unbelievably complex coast, it, it allows there to be this unique ecosystems that, that have developed over, over time and have created these independent pockets where, where we see just such incredible diversity. And for me, a big part of why I love this place in terms of the physical geography is that there's simply so many opportunities for fun, whether it's, it's surfing like this or it's chasing, chasing the mountains or it's kayaking or it's rock climbing. Like we have, we have it all. We live in an adventurer's paradise and we're so lucky to be here. So there's endless places to play. So when we, when we think of the coast of BC, we, we, this is a photo that to me really sums it up. And, and that's because it really looks like this a lot of the time. We, we, we live in a place that really is, it's dictated by rain and it's dictated by these big wet weather systems that come from the West. So they come off the Pacific Ocean and they're traveling to the East they come and they meet British Columbia and they unload unbelievable amounts of rain. We, we do have some of the wettest places on the planet here on the coast of BC. And now we say it rains a lot. We know that it rains a lot, but we also know that there is huge variation in um, just how much it rains depending on where you are. So as these heavy clouds move off the Pacific Ocean and travel in towards Vancouver Island, the Olympic Mountains, and the Central and North Coast, they're met with these really high and dramatic mountain ranges. And so as these heavy wet clouds are traveling, they come up against these mountains, they're forced to unload all that moisture, and they drop up most of that rain on the western slopes. And the eastern slopes end up having much, much less rain. And so this is the rain shadow effect. And it really dictates a lot of life here on the coast. So when we can see this, and we think of some of our viewers here are, are tuning in from Euclid and Tofino, you guys have an average annual precipitation of just over 3,000 millimeters. Whereas those in, in Victoria and, and Sydney, you guys are looking at more, more around 600 mils. So quite a dramatic variation. And so now it is these, these physical and climatic character, characteristics that really allow certain species to, to exist in certain areas. And so what we have here is a biogeoclimatic zone map. And so this is done by the, the province of BC. And essentially, these different ecosystem types based on these similarities in physical as well as biological characteristics. So when we zoom in a little bit closer, uh, we look at this yellow here. So the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem, as we see, it's, it's quite limited to the, uh, the southern, southeastern side of Vancouver Island, as well as the lower mainland. This is the rain shadow forest we have on the coast. This is where we see drier species like Arbutus and Gary Oak and the dominant tree species, the coastal Douglas fir. Then as we move to wetter regions, we see the, uh, the more classic temperate rainforest that we imagine, the coastal western hemlock forest. And this is where we see the towering Sitka spruce, the uh, western red cedar, as well as the, the most common tree in these forests, the coastal western hemlock. So this would be most of our lower wetter regions. As you start moving up the slopes, as you head up the mountains and the conditions get harsher and harsher, we see a transition to the, from western hemlock and Douglas fir to mountain hemlock. So these are our forests that still allow tree growth, but the conditions are starting to get harsher and harsher as we get higher. And then finally, as you start climbing further and further into the alpine, we have the coastal mountain heather alpine. And this is what you would picture being your alpine bogs, areas that the, the environment is really shaped by the amount of snowpack that's there. And that really determines the growing season. So if we imagine we have places where the snow may not melt until, until July, that, that leaves a pretty short growing season. And so for a lot of tree species, they, they essentially get, uh, get shunted out of there. So this is what really, this is where my love is here in, in terms of, of British Columbia. I'm a, I know I'm a nature nerd, and I've been called that many, many times in my life, but it's the, the biodiversity and the richness of British Columbia that really makes me, makes me love this place and makes me want to constantly learn more. And, and so British Columbia is Canada's most biodiverse province. 
And the term biodiversity and, and biodiverse, it's used for a lot of different things and it has a lot of different meanings. And so when I'm using biodiverse or biodiversity here, I'm talking about species richness, the amount of different species that are found in an environment. And so British Columbia has more species than any province in British Columbia. We have over 2000 species of vascular plants, 509 species of birds, 149 species of mammals, and thousands and thousands more. Some of them may come in the form of this beautiful little orange jelly fungus that we see growing on a uh, decomposing stick in a, what looks like a, quite a wet, uh, wet old growth forest. We've got beautiful species like this northern red-legged frog, an endangered species that we know really depends on uh, healthy forest ecosystems to survive. And then we move from the small to the, to the large. And uh, these are critters that we, that we like to call the charismatic megafauna. So the charismatic, they're, they're charming and they are mega, they're large. They are our charismatic megafauna. So this is our grizzly bears, our spirit bear or Kermode bear, which is a white morph of a black bear. And this species is, is quite unique to the coast of British Columbia and it's, a lot of people don't know this, but it's actually only found on a, a select few islands on the coast of BC. Unbelievably rare, unbelievably important. And then there's this guy, Sasquatch, Gigantopithecus, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call him, whether you're a believer or not. I've heard a very compelling argument made that essentially if, if Bigfoot were to exist anywhere on earth, he would exist on the British Columbia coast. There's essentially nowhere else in the world that has this same vast tracts of, of wilderness that they could potentially live without being seen too often. And then we take the shift from the temperate to the marine. We have species like the beautiful bull kelp, which creates these amazing near shark kelp forests that play nursery to thousands of different species. We have we have seafloor, we have benthos, we have these areas of invertebrates and, and uh, marine plant life that is, it's so vibrant and so colorful and so rich with species like this basket star that really look, they look like something from space and not something that lives close to home. And then we have, we have species that simply just make us smile to look at. This opalescent nudibranch is always a crowd pleaser, one of the most beautiful and vibrant that we have on the coast, but among many, many, many others. And we, we move from the small and we go back to this charismatic megafauna. And, and this guy here, the, the humpback whale, we've been so lucky on this coast to see such a massive rebound in populations of humpback whales where we're seeing them in areas that, that our parents never used to see them. And then we have this, this strange sort of fuzzy realm where the marine environment and the terrestrial environment overlap. And so yes, what we are looking at here is a pile of poop. So this is bear poop. I'm guessing black bear poop based on where we were. And it's poop that's on the beach. And so what, I'm not just showing you a photo of poop to say, <laughs> I got the kids to look at a, you know, a photo of poop. It, it's here to really illustrate this, this blending of worlds, this marine environment, these, these berry seeds being deposited on the beach and those forest nutrients ending up in the ocean. And then those ocean nutrients ending back up in the forest as the Pacific sam salmon find their way into the, into the river systems and the streams, the bears drag them into the forest and they play fertilizer for all the different organisms that live here on this coast. So when we think of 40,000 uh, 40, islands and 25,000 or 25,000 islands, um, okay, let's start that over. So it was 40,000, islands and 25,000 kilometers of shoreline, we have to think about that as there being a huge amount of interaction between the marine and the terrestrial realm. That was a tongue twister. Okay, and now we, we can't talk about the coast of, of BC without acknowledging the fact that this, this environment has evolved with people. First Nations people have been on this coast for millennia and the plants and animals that we see are a result of people coexisting and managing these resources for, for eons. 
And we're really lucky, those of us who are currently working on the coast, that, that we're seeing this really incredible cultural resurgence where these communities are, are really establishing themselves as the managers and protectors of their, of their landscapes. And, and it's really been a privilege to, to be able to, to be a part of that and to help uplift students. Um, and then we see we think see things like this. So this is a uh, a traditional cedar weir that was that was used to harvest salmon in traditional times. Whereas this one is actually being used for scientific purposes. So we see this really neat mixture of these traditional ways of doing things that were super effective being blended with these really modern uh, scientific techniques. And when we talk about traditional, I think it's really important that that when we when we say that word, we, we acknowledge the fact that traditional does not mean that it is a thing of the past. That these resources and these ways of doing things are, are just as important to people on the coast uh, in these First Nations communities as they ever have been. So we would not be the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation without, you know, kind of bringing a little bit of reality to the situation. We know that, that we are in an unprecedented time where the world is changing rapidly and Our generation is climate change and, and we're seeing it here in British Columbia, whether it's alpine plants or forests climbing higher and higher into mountains or species moving further and further north, or it's these massive increases in forest fires that we're now seeing. In my lifetime here, I don't remember ever being smoked out in the summers like this, like we've had in the last five years. There's risks like this, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This has been huge news. It's been one of the largest issues in, in nationwide politics in Canada. And, and the reason for that is, is, is this right here. If the Trans Mountain Pipeline were to be approved, we would see a 700% increase in oil tanker traffic in the Sailor Sea. And now what that means is that we would see uh, not only increased risk of oil spills, but also just increased presence, increased shipping, increased impacts on the animals that, that really need these areas in order to survive. And so as we see here, we see the, the red, the red that we see on this map is showing where the southern resident orcas need to uh, feed themselves in the summertime. And then the different shades of gray essentially show the, the probability of there being oil on those shorelines if there was to be an event, um, say a catastrophic oil spill. Another issue that's, that's really near and dear to my heart is old growth logging. So when I say old growth forests, old growth forests are defined as forests that have been developing for 250 years or longer without being uh, disturbed. And when we think about disturbed, we, we think about sort of a commercial logging or clear cutting. So this was sort of the original picture here when, uh, when Europeans first arrived. And then this is what we're looking at now. So a huge reduction in the amount of productive old growth forests. And the, the issue here is that when they replant these areas, these forests that took millennia to develop, never developed the same ecological characteristics in the 60 years that they're allowed to grow before they're replanted. And what does that look like? In a lot of places, especially here on Vancouver Island, that looks like entire valleys being completely scalped. With modern technology as it is, forests can go from the one on the right to the one on the left in an outstandingly short amount of time. Another issue, we've talked about the importance of, of salmon and, and also Pacific herring. And without these species, our coast is, it's missing that pulse it needs to get through the, the winter and start the season. And well, commercial fishing has had very negative impacts on the, uh, the wild populations of fish, but it's not just commercial fisheries that have these impacts. It's many, many different factors, such as the destruction of river habitat, the destruction of nearshore shoreline where herring may spawn. So it is many, many factors that all come into play to really uh, exert all kinds of pressure on these, these organisms that we really need in order to survive on this coast. And then this one here, this is something that Rain Coast works near and, and sort of, we, we would have put a lot of energy into this because it's something that we're just simply not ethically okay with. This was a grizzly bear that was trophy hunted. This bear was shot, likely from a boat, given that they're in an estuary. 
um, by these two men. They probably took the head, they took the claws, and they probably left the meat without eating it. So hunting for sport without consuming the animals. We as an organization are not opposed to people hunting for food at all. Many of us hunt ourselves, but we are opposed to animals being shot just so that people can feel tough, pose in front of their, uh, their big kill and make themselves, you know, feel like big, strong men. Uh, so th these are some of the, some of the issues that, that we see here on the coast that are, they may seem so large that, you know, what do we do about it? But the nice thing is, is that as I've been telling you all these negative things, I'm going to shift and I'm going to say, hey, there's things that can be done. So this grizzly bear here was shot before a couple of years ago, the provincial government introduced a ban on the hunting of grizzly bears. So because of Raincoast efforts, as well as many others, we have finally achieved a ban on the hunting of grizzly bears for sport. But there's still trophy hunting going on. So what Raincoast has been doing is we've been buying guide licenses. So it means that if you're not from BC and you wanna come here and hunt in these regions, you actually have to go out on our boat and go hunting with us. And well, we're pretty terrible hunters and most of the shots we get are taken with cameras. This one comes a little bit, to, a little bit closer to home and sometimes, sometimes solutions come in the form of just getting your hands dirty. So this is the lower Fraser estuary, the very, interface between the ocean and the longest river in British Columbia. Now this area, the lower estuary, is so unbelievably important as habitat for juvenile fish and unfortunately because of the amount of commercial shipping that goes in and out of Vancouver, they've really removed all this incredible habitat that salmon need in order to develop before they reach the ocean. So it was these, these dams or these retaining walls that were blocking fish from entering these really important salt marshes. So Raincoast partnered with, with the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, as well as many other groups uh, to essentially get in and, and get our hands dirty. We removed these dams. We allowed water to enter these salt marsh. And within the same day, we started to see juvenile fish returning to these places that would have for thousands of years been super important rearing habitat. So this is, this is what I have to say. And, and this is an extremely difficult presentation because you've probably picked up, I love to talk and I have a lot to say. And the topic of British Columbia is so diverse and there's so much to, so much to introduce you to, but I hope that this really provided you with a good overview and, and started to kind of get the wheels turning in terms of why you love BC and, and why you, why you're here, why are you watching these videos? And, and we really hope that, that with the future videos that are to come in the next coming weeks, that we really help foster that, that care and that love for this place. And so before I finish up here, I have to say that this, there's no way that this project would have come together without the incredible contributions of all these different supporters. But, uh, but really the, the big thanks goes out to our host here today, uh, Maureen Vo. She is really the one that, that made this, this whole thing come together. So, so we have to owe a big thank you to her. And beyond that, it was, it was the photography that, uh, that really made this, this slideshow what it is. I can't introduce you to the coast of BC without taking you there. And, and these photographers really generously um, allowed us to use their work to, to help engage you guys. And so before I finish up for the day, I'm gonna leave you guys with, with a challenge. And, and so what this, what this challenge is going to be is every week, they might start to get a little bit more difficult, but we're gonna start early. And really the goal here is to get you outside and to start kind of getting the wheels turning and, I find that it's really hard to get to know an organism until you've put a name to it. And so the first activity is going to be go out into your backyard, into your local park, into your local beach. And I want you to take photos of three different native species. Once you've taken the photos, I want you to bring them home and I want you to go out and identify what they are. So you are going to take those photos. You're going to send them to Maureen at raincoast.org and you are going to include what species you think they are. And now there's many different ways to uh, find out what very best resource would be this book. I'm sure many of you guys, your parents have this in the house. And the other one is simply just using Google. Type in what something looks like, defining features, colors of flowers, type of plumage on the bird. 
Um, so there you go. There's challenge number one. Thank you for joining me and uh, I'm going to hand things off to Maureen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nate, for sharing your knowledge on this beautiful coastline that we live. So seeing those captivating images really makes this coast come alive and really appreciate this special place that we live in. And it is like no other on this planet. So I look forward to going out on the coast and hopefully bringing more people and inspiring others. So I hope everyone joy enjoyed this episode and we'd love to hear your thoughts. So if you have feedback, it'd be great to send them to, again, the email is maureen at raincoast.org. And if you could send it with the title of the episode in the subject line, we'd love to hear um, more about what you thought. Thank you, Nate, again, for being our feature presenter for today. And I just want to say, stay motivated, stay positive, and hopefully see you next time. Until next time, this is Maureen casting off.